It's a gorgeous spring day, so it's a perfect time to show you this Cessna 172M behind me. As you can see, it is in beautiful condition. And when you're buying a plane, the condition is important. You want to have something that you're proud of to take your friends and family. And when you fly into a different airport, you turn heads and this plane definitely does that. A lot of times to get that kind of condition and quality you need to look at a newer more expensive plane but what we did is we bought a solid 172M and then we did a complete refurbishment on it and that way you can have this plane in beautiful condition for a fraction of the cost of buying a new one. About two years ago we went ahead and we bought this 172M to refurbish. In this video, I'm going to walk you through the steps we took in that refurbishing process. Now, I wish I had individual videos of the different stages of the process, but I honestly hadn't planned on making a video about it, so I'm just going to have to walk you through the steps as we go and explain what we did along the way. Now, this gorgeous 172M is for sale. If you're interested, we've got the link below to in the description of this video to go to our website where you can see all of the logbooks since new and all of the detailed specifications of the plane. So the first step in the refurbishment process is to select the right plane. Now we selected a Cessna 172M for multiple reasons. One of the main and first reasons is that it is one of the most desired models out there. The 172M had multiple improvements over the older model Cessna 172s, including the camber lift wing, which helped with the stall characteristics and slow flight characteristics, as well as allowed for larger fuel tanks. The 172M also has one of the best engines ever put into the small GA planes, the Lycoming O320 E2D. So when you find your right plane, your right base, then the next step is to check it. You need to make sure you have a solid airframe because obviously the one thing you can't really change when you're doing a refurbishment is the airframe. When you're looking for the plane to refurbish, you want to look at the history, you want a solid airframe and this particular plane was actually owned by a um, highly experienced pilot and it was owned in the Midwest down in Iowa so those factors combined to make it a good solid plane for us to start out with. Now this particular plane hadn't been flown for many years before we purchased it. It was actually sitting on a grass runway and the one good thing was that the owner would go out and he would start it up and just starting it on the ground isn't the same as flying. You have to make sure that you get those engine RPMs up, get the oil up to good operating temperature because that evaporates the moisture and that's what keeps the engine from getting corroded when it sits for a long time. Once we had found the plane, we had an experienced mechanic go through and do a complete pre-buy inspection on it to double check everything. We wanted to check for corrosion. We wanted to make sure it was a good solid airframe. This is actually a low airframe on it there's only about 3500 hours on the airframe on this plane so that's another key component when you're doing a refurbishment is try to find a lower um, hour airframe overall the main components of the plane seem to be in good condition even the gauges and things like that were still clean and clear so overall this plane was found to be in good condition the gauges were clean the main components were in good shape it was a privately owned plane not used by a flight school and no damage history during our inspection process, we even had to hand prop it to get it started so that we could go ahead and feel how the engine listened to the engine running. And then we also made sure we checked the compressions, things like that. Just our overall basic pre-buy, but in a much more depth because it had been sitting for a while. So all the compressions came back in okay condition. There was one just a little bit low, but it was still within limits. So we were able to go ahead and apply for a ferry permit in order to get it off of the grass strip and back to the field for the mechanic to start the work on it. So a ferry permit is a one-time permit that's issued for a plane after a mechanic has inspected it, said that it's in airworthy condition to get it on a VFR flight from point A to point B in order to have maintenance or other repairs done on it. So once we got our ferry permit approved, the pilot went in to the grass strip, got in the plane, took off and started flying. Noticed after taking off that uh, one of the indicators actually wasn't working. I believe it was a pitot tube that was blocked so the airspeed indicator wasn't operating. 
Now, if something like that happens, a situation like that in flight, the first thing you want to do is set up known power settings. Obviously, with the 172M, you even have a little bit better time of it because it's very difficult to stall the plane. So it's a very safe plane to fly in that type of situation. You can also use the winds aloft and uh, mobile app, use your check your ground speed and be able to calculate your approximate true airspeed to give you an indication and just make sure you're within safe parameters. We'd really appreciate if you take a minute to like our video, subscribe to our channel, and of course any questions or comments, feel free to leave them below. We always do our best to answer them whenever we can. Now that we found a plane that we're going to refurbish, the next step is to do a full detailed annual and make sure that all of the mechanical components are taken care of. We started the annual on this. It was one of the most detailed annuals you'll find on a 172 done by one of the most experienced mechanics that you'll find. Went in and replaced over 24 parts on it, and not all of those really needed to be done, but we tend to overdo it when it comes to maintenance. Make sure everything is safe. After doing that extensive annual, we flew the plane for about 75 hours. And during that time, it proved to be a very solid, reliable plane, starting right up every time and running really nice. The engine is the most important part of a plane. This Cessna 172M has the Lycoming O320E2D. And this engine is actually one of the reasons that the 172M is the most popular 172 out there and the most desired. Now when it sits on the ground, it's obviously not a good thing for the engines, they need to be run. So the owner of this one, he actually did do multiple startups over time and that's not always a good thing unless it's run up to full operating temperature and gets the engine really warm so that it can clean out the moisture and you can tell from the condition of this one that that was done properly because not only does it have high compressions 79, 76, 78 and 78 it also had a good oil analysis which we had done on it just after we got it as well When we went and refurbished it, we did quite a few things. We did new spark plugs, a newer overhauled cylinder on one of them, and then we also replaced other important parts, things like the vacuum pump and the voltage regulator up there. Those were done as well. Now one of the things that I would do and consider to do is put in an oil filter adapter. It has the screen back here, which is what they come with standard, and it's only a thing as far as doing the oil changes. It's a convenience factor. For one thing, it's easier to um, put out a different filter. And the other thing is that as an owner, you're able to do that yourself, whereas when it's a screen like that, you would have to have a mechanic help you sign off on the oil change. A few more things to point out on here. They are the original Lycoming cylinders and good, good compressions on all of them. After we got it, we've actually put over 75 hours on this engine, on this airplane, since it was sitting. So we can tell you that, yes, it runs nice every single time, just starts right up, couple of prime pumps, and it just started. Even in 20 below degrees, when we had that engine heater plugged in for a few hours, we would set the timer on it, warm it up for a few hours before we start, starts right off. A couple more convenient things here is it's got the quick drain for the oil. So you can actually put a hose on here and be able to run it out the back of the cowling so you don't even have to take the bottom cowling off to do an oil change so that's nice and then over here you've got your plug-in so it's got two little clips on there you just go ahead and take those two screws off and you can actually start it and jump it that way as well since the battery's up front here so a lot of nice convenient things up on this engine we didn't find any leaks or any squawks all of the components seem to be in good condition we even did an engine oil analysis to make sure that the internal components of the engine were in good condition. Didn't find any issues, so we decided time to move on to the next step of the refurbishment process. The third step is paint. Now airplane painting is one of the most difficult things that you will do on a plane. First of all, it's hard to find a paint shop. Then you've got to find a good one, and you got to check in, find their schedule, Sometimes you're waiting weeks, months, even years to get on the schedule. A complete strip and then repaint with multicolors and high quality paint can easily cost $18,000. Yeah, aircraft painting is that expensive. Just on materials alone for this particular paint job, we spent over $5,400. Because not only is the actual painting of 
the plane expensive and time consuming, but materials are also expensive. For example, in order to mask any of the plastics and windows, you need to have a special aluminum masking sheet as well as aluminum tape. And not only are materials expensive, but it also requires high quality HVLP guns, pressure pots, a proper air filtering system. There's a lot of components that have to be invested in when you're doing aircraft painting. The paint shop we used was actually not located on an airfield, so we had to transport the plane. In order to do that, we had to take the wings off for transport. I really wish we hadn't needed to remove the wings. First we had to make some wood braces to support the wings when we're taking it off, drain the fuel, disconnect them, load them for transport, then brought them back and reinstalled it after we were done. The whole process took about an extra four days. So there are two main ways that people paint aircraft. There's the sand and paint method, where you sand the surface of the paint, roughen it up, and then you paint over it. When you're doing just a sand and paint, you usually have to use the original design or it'll show through. It is faster and more cost effective, but the better option is the strip and paint method. Now this is an extensive process. First you strip everything to the bare metal, then you prep it, and you paint it. In this process, you actually use a chemical stripper, commercial sprayers to spray the stripper on, and then wash off that old paint and primer. You have to use a special masking tape and aluminum film to mask the glasses and the other plastic surfaces that you can't remove. As for the paint itself, there are various types of paint that people use. I've even seen some use automotive paint to try and save money. But if you're painting an airplane, you should use high quality products that are made for the job because they last a long time. Another thing is, is that bare aluminum has to be prepared very carefully. Otherwise, the paint's gonna start to peel as we've seen on some airplanes when we've looked. Now one of the steps, no matter how you do the painting process, is that you must remove all control surfaces. It's actually required by the FAA to reweigh and balance any control surfaces after painting or other modifications. Obviously you have to mask everything as well. So the glasses, again, have to mask with a special aluminum foil because the stripper can damage glass or other plastic components. So when you're removing the surfaces, once you get them ready to put back on there, you actually go in and you grease everything and you put in new hardware, and that actually makes it in better condition than what you'd find just from doing um, basic maintenance on it. So that's one of the nice things about having to remove all of those surfaces is that you get all of those new components put back together on it. So again, you need to mask everything, and the glasses have to mask with a special aluminum foil because the stripper that you use on the aluminum can damage glass and other plastic components, and that foil roll alone costs about $400. So typically they use a commercial sprayer to spray the stripper on and then a pressure washer to remove it. Sometimes you have to do multiple applications in different areas just to get everything off. Once the metal is completely clean, you use an allodyne etch, and that allodyne etch is the metal which makes the bond between the aluminum and the primer stronger when you spray it. So then you go in and you prime the whole plane, and it's best to use a high build corrosion resistant epoxy primer, that thick green stuff. That makes a good base to apply the base coat of paint. You mask the accents you want to spray, then you paint those. And of course it doesn't sound all that bad, but it requires very good skills and experience, and it also takes a lot of time. I actually spoke to the owner of a large aircraft paint shop, and he mentioned that they will allocate about 300 man hours to paint a small airplane. I don't know just the exact time frame. Painting brings a new life to a plane, though. When you look at this plane, it looks fantastic. 
buying a newer plane with this nice of look will cost at least four times as much. I have to apologize, it is getting so windy out here. Hopefully you can still hear me. Now I mentioned about that stripper having an issue with plastics. So unfortunately when that was being applied, somehow some of that stripper did get on the windshield. So we actually had to go in and we had to replace the windshield on the front. That was a bit of a bummer. But to top it off, when the mechanic was going to install the windshield, actually ended up cracking the first one. And I want to show you here, it kind of a bummer because it was just one little spot right in the corner and you can see it just cracked and as soon as something starts on there, it just goes and there's no saving it. And those windshields cost about $900. So then we had to wait another, what was it, like two weeks to get a new windshield in, pay for the second windshield to come in and finally get it installed. And when we were doing the front windshield, we went ahead and we did the black back one as well. So we've got new glass on both the front and the back. And then the four side windows are in pretty decent condition, but there's a little bit of spots here and there. Overall, fairly clean, can still see out of them pretty good. On to the fourth step, the interior. So if you take a look at the interior of this one, the f carpet and the seat upholstery has been completely redone. The carpet you can buy for about $700. They'll send you out some samples with the different materials and coloring. And then what they do is they cut it to match with everything sewn in. And it's a, two or three different strips usually that has some Velcro in between to fasten them together. It's as simple as pulling the seats out, pulling the old carpet out, putting the new carpet down, marking a few holes for some of the bolts, and you got it. So super simple on that. Now as for the seat upholstery, that you need to work with somebody that can make the seats for you because there's a few different steps to the process and you need to make sure that you're getting the right materials. Now when you're doing the seats, what's actually kind of unique about it is that they designed these seats to make them lightweight. When the engineers were doing it, what they did is they designed the frame to hold just on the outside edge. And then what you do is you use a backing material like this. This is some leftover that we had and you cut this to the shape of the frame and then you stick it on with a glue that's kind of like a contact cement. And that's your structure that you actually sit on. Then when you buy it from a company, now this is for a different plane that we're um, doing, so not this one, you actually get them and they'll come prefabricated to fit with the sewing and everything done, the foam already inserted. Once you have that black backing, you basically set this down, fit it around the frame, tuck it underneath, and fasten it in place. Very simple. The one thing you have to be careful of and remember with aircraft materials, especially on the interior, is they have to be a special flame resistant material. So you want to make sure you're working with a reputed company that works on aircraft materials and aircraft interiors so that they've already done the flame testing on it so you know you're getting the right materials for your project. The final step of the interior is usually the plastics. So a lot of times you can refurbish the plastics. On this particular plane, almost everything was in pretty good shape. So we just went ahead and refurbished, cleaned everything up. There's a few minor spots throughout that you'll see um, little spots. But even if you needed to replace them, they're usually fairly inexpensive to get an individual piece or whatever if you needed to. And then you just have to have it painted to match the rest of the interior. The main thing you've got to be sure of is you're getting the right part numbers. And not just on the big components like the panels and the seats and things like that, but each and every single part on a certified plane has a part number, including the screws. So you need to make sure that you're matching that with, or you're getting an approved upgraded version when you're doing replacements. And lastly, we have the panel. So on this one, like I said in the beginning, the gauges and actually everything were in really decent condition. It already had the dual upgraded digital um, navcoms in there and the VORs and everything like that. So we actually didn't have to do anything on the panel on this one. Just cleaned up the plastics and it was good to go. And now for the final step of your refurbishment process, obviously get in and enjoy the plane that you've just finished doing all your upgrades on. So let's go ahead and get it started up and take it for a test flight.
We're flying basically hands-free, no control input. And with the turbulence, it kind of leveled itself back out, smoothed itself out. We're using that trim wheel in order to have the elevator trimmed out to maintain the altitude. And then it'll pretty much fly itself, hands-free, even in this little bit of turbulence, as long as you don't mind watching it going back and forth just a little bit, you get a pretty much hands-free flight. Now it's springtime in Minnesota, so all the lakes are thawing out. But obviously we don't have any color on the leaves yet or any grass starting to grow back yet, but it's still a gorgeous view. It's a beautiful day to be out flying. And using just the screen on the right, we can maintain our altitude. You can watch the ground speed. You can see your bank angle. Able to check your direction and the compass. Of course, all of this is including, you can watch for traffic, both for ADS-B on there, as well as what you're looking for outside. So all of your primary information is available right in front of you on the right side. I honestly can't wait till we have the technology to do a more immersive experience. So we have the cabin heat turned on, is the knob out here, but it is honestly so warm in here today. Yeah, we want to pull that, put that in. I actually have experience of flying this during the winter when it was about 10 below zero and we were basically in just a long sleeve shirts and we were definitely warm enough without any other type of jacket or anything on. So it definitely has really warm cabin heat on this plane. Deep traffic center, Tango, 3,000 climbs to about 4,000. Uh, we're currently going to be holding over Jolpa, and it will be, uh, we'll do two turns, and then it will be inbound for our 3-1. We've got both a tachometer and also a Hobbs meter on the plane. That's beneficial when you're using it for training. If your flight instructor likes to set up, or you like to set up and use the tenths of an hour for the Hobbs meter, then we've got that very easily on the right hand side and then obviously your tack is down here in your RPM gauge as well so you can monitor both numbers. So having the screen over here on this side is very beneficial when you're flying from the right seat oftentimes it's hard to see all of the gauges on the left side so you can see them right in front of you you have the traffic on the map you've got all of your gauges in the synthetic on the synthetic vision side it's a good backup practice as well for when you're wanting to learn glass panel. You've got the layout that you would when you've got a glass panel set up. So it's a good way to train in that, but still having the primary gauges showing up as the analog so that you can refer back to them when you're in the learning process. Notification there with 500 AGL. Our landing checklist, fuel both. Mixtures full rich, car heats on. Up settings. Obviously you can land with just about any flap settings on the 172. This one is a little bit unique. It's still got the 40 degrees of flaps option in there. Although I hardly ever used it when I was flying. As always, I hope you enjoyed watching our video today. We'd really appreciate if you take a minute to like our video, subscribe to our channel, and of course any questions or comments, feel free to leave them below. We always do our best to answer them whenever we can.